Okay, so Jeremy, thank you for organizing this. Uh, we have a dense uh, agenda. Um, Andre um, suggested to run it through a reverse sort. Um, so Andre, do you wanna just go ahead? Yes, so with GSOC, we submitted our application, I believe last week. And um, maybe I'll share my screen, just very quickly show you the ideas. Would you mind Milan enabling me um, so I can share it, share my screen, I mean. Go ahead. Cool. Let's see, share screen. Uh, I'll share my whole desktop. Let me know once you can see my screen. I see it. Yep. Awesome. I so see this, it. Awesome. So this is the Fortran line GitHub and I think it's on, on this um, website and it's in a wiki. So we have, well, we have the organization application that's already submitted, so we don't have to do that. And then the project ideas, these are our current project ideas. Um, if you have other ideas, you know, uh, please let us know. We can include them. Also, if you want to mentor, let us know. Um, the thing to discuss now is um, how to advertise. What I would do is I would advertise it at Twitter and maybe other places that we applied. But I just kind of want to warn you that the chance is still very low that we get in. So if we do get in, that'd be awesome. But I don't want to get your hopes up. <laughs> so, so what I was thinking, we should advertise, but kind of the main advertisement would come if, if we get in. Right, and actually at the time when I suggested this as an item, I, I didn't quite understand uh, the process correctly. I thought students apply at the same time when Google is deciding on the orgs rather than going in sequence, but it's actually in sequence. So we'll, we will or will not be chosen as an org and only after that the students apply. That's that's correct. We can okay. still use this opportunity to advertise that we applied. I think that's great, but you know, the student advertisement should come after we get in. Um, say it again, I missed it. Sorry, uh, that was just some or something else. So I think, is there anything else for GSOC or can we move on to the next item? Moving on. When, uh, when do we know? Um, yeah, Milan is in March. March 9. March 9. Okay. All right, so the number two, let's see, that was, um, oh, the translation of the website. Um, so for that, it's this, I guess coming, coming back here, I guess it's the same, repository, but it's the pull request. Um, it's this pull request that, that makes, um, tran allows translating the website. And in general, it looks good. The only issue is that it, currently the way it's set up is that uh, if you look at the actual changes, each translation, unfortunately has to copy some of the markup. I'll show you. and. Um, you know, if I scroll down a little bit, like, yeah, let's say this, this one, um, oh, that's in English. Let's, let, let's look up at some of the translations. Um, it's a little bit down. Yeah, let's say this one, it's in, uh, you know, so as you can see, you have to copy this markup. And the issue is that, you know, we want to maintain the English website and we want to change and rearrange how things look. Uh, move things around as well as add and change text. And the problem is if we change anything on the English website, then the, the, the translated website will be old unless we change it in all 30 plus down the road languages, which is very, I don't think it's scales super well. And the, the way to do it in my opinion, and I suggested that is to set up the translation so that it translates just the text and it automatically extracts the text. And if you modify the English text, then the translation tool will tell you that the translated text is not up to date. 
And so, and so the Simpy web page, as an example, I get, gave links in the document in the discussion. That's exactly how we do it. And so, what happens in the translated pages is that sometimes there are English words because they haven't been updated. The translation hasn't been updated, but all the markup, all the HTML, or everything else is exactly the same on every translated page. And we only have to modify the English version. And so, I very strongly suggest to do that. Otherwise, it seems to me it's going to be a lot of work for us to maintain this whole thing. Andre, um, I agree. Uh, is this, so where we have a translation in the markup, is that only in certain like metadata that goes into say headers, like page titles, sections, things like that, or there's something more than that? It seems to me, at least maybe with Jekyll, it's kind of either impossible or very difficult to avoid because I don't think you can specify everything in Markdown. Yes, content goes in Markdown, but there's some things about styling about the items that go into say the nav bar that would be translated. How, how do you go around that? And maybe we're hitting, as somebody in the, in the pull request discussion suggested, we're hitting a limit with Jekyll and Jekyll plugins. At the time when I started this website, I chose Jekyll only because I was familiar and comfortable with it. I'm not very proficient with it. Uh, definitely not at this level uh, of internationalizations. If this is a limit that we're hitting with Jekyll, I think it's a good time to explore other frameworks and just migrate. Um, migration if one or few people are familiar, somewhat familiar with both frameworks that we're transitioning from and to, it shouldn't be more than a few hours of work to just migrate. I would uh, say, yeah, if we decide to migrate, we should do it before we merge this pull request because it's going to be a lot more hours after. Um, oh yeah, I agree. And so that's my only, that's why I would wait until we really nail this down. As you can see, so with the translation it looks like, like the pages, titles and stuff like that. It's this, FR, let's say for French, fr.yaml, which has the French kind of titles. But it looks like there is more, I guess, I don't know if there is a way to do like a view file. Andre, uh, yeah. might I ask um, what uh, generator you're using for the Senpai website? Do you know? So we don't use, yeah, well, let's have a look. Uh, uh, because Sebastian's pointed out that, uh, so, yes, um, this is a limitation of Jekyll, but I believe he's also pointed right. out that the same limitation exists in Hugo as well. So, um, right. it, you know, choosing the, the static uh, site generators. Yes. So in SimPy, we have the sources branch that has... Uh, the... Maybe I can comment on this. Uh, yes, please, Sebastian, if you're able to. Um, so SimPy is using a get text based uh, approach. So you get uh, compiled from the, Eng yeah, from the English translation automatically PO file, which contains all the English sentences. And then you can use this PO file to create a new translation and you will get text-based replacement of those sentences from the translated language. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of tools from the glibc uh, which allows to manage those files and merge those files, and translate those files. So what we don't have in Jekyll is anything which is related to those uh, get text-based approach. It's there are the last plugin is five years old and not maintained anymore, which would allow a get text-based approach where we insert these PO files. Okay, yeah. so okay. it sounds like the de get text approach is, um, it, it sounds like a good way of going. Um, if you want to go, yeah, if I can um, choose. It looks like SimPy isn't, is it not using any kind of static site generator on top of that? Or? Yeah, I was going to show you exactly how it works. So here is an example, a donate page in SimPy and it's using, so we are using this, uh, I think it's called, um, uh, 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 it starts with J, I cannot remember, I know. It's the, this, this, this um, um, Jinja, I think. So, it's uh, yeah, 
in, uh, maybe I can clarify this. I think Simpa is using something based on swings. And there's a swings plugin, which is called uh, Babel, where you uh, can generate get text based translations. So and you get these PO files and can manage them automatically. So from the user perspective, in this case, you essentially every every text you surround it with <coughs> trans and entrans um, macros, I guess. And then uh, the tool automatically creates you this file, let's say for the Czech language, cs.po, and it gives you the English text, and then the trans and then you put in the translated text. And then when you update the English um, version, it it will tell you that the tool will tell you which text needs to be updated. So as a translator, all you have to do is just worry about the text. And here is how it looks like. So you can see there's no markup; it's just the text. And then, um, and then, and that's it, pretty much. And you can see, you know, all the markup is done in the English version, and just the text is translated. So that's that's how the get text in general works. So the Assuming you agree this is preferable, the question is, how do we get something like this working with uh, Jekyll or any other side generator? Well, yeah, so I was just asking because it looks like we can't do it with Jekyll because of the reason Sebastian points so, out. So I was wondering um, why we don't just migrate to the same um, static site generator that you use for SimPy and use well, the So I think there are two ways. We can either migrate to something else or we can try to uh, develop something on our own. So the plugin we are currently using is not too bad. Does, uh, it's missing some features to make it possible to do the same thing GetTex is doing. But we would have to implement it in this plugin. So Jekyll plugins are written in Ruby. I'm a bit fam familiar with Ruby, so I might be able to implement it in upstream those changes we need. Question is, uh, is Jekyll a sustainable solution for the Fortran Lang web, web page? And is it worth the effort to, um, to make those changes? Well, I think we don't know this. <laughs> so we have to, um, so I don't know if you want to kind of discuss it here at this phone call or if you want to set up a special phone call just to kind of figure out how to do this. Um, Milan, what do you think? I think this will be quite a challenge to find a good solution for, so I think it warrants a dedicated discussion. So maybe, um, we, I think we just have to play. I think we should try, we should try this some kind of, this get text solution. Uh, I think we should probably brainstorm, kind of figure out some alternatives, um, and and then we and then we should meet over phone call and discuss which of these alternatives uh, uh, would uh, you know would work. Yeah, this specific simpy solution for translations seems reasonable to me, but I'm completely unfamiliar with everything else about it, so. I can't say, oh, this looks like the way to go. I, I don't know how it integrated Markdown. Looks like we are not using Markdown in SimPy. Looks like it's just HTML. So um, yeah, we have to look at that. I don't know, do, do we want to move uh, forward or do you want to discuss this more? I vote move on. So then the next, so the next on the agenda is STDLab. And I was wondering if we can just quickly start um, with, uh, I sent the link with um, the Fortran Runtime Math Library. Would it be okay, Milan? Sure. So I uh, created an issue and looks like, um, essentially STDLib has been designed or our initial idea was to create a reference implementation of um, of things, and one of them would be math functions, um, those that are not intrinsic. So as an example, Bessel functions of anything other than integer kind. The integer kinds are intrinsic, but half integer are uh, not. Um, but what I found out when developing L4 trend is that we need a standard library, even for the intrinsic functions. And 
what occurred to me is that if stdlib could include the intrinsic reference implementation of the intrinsic function also, as an example, it would include Bessel functions of the integer kind also, even though they are intrinsic, uh, it would allow compilers like l to just, just easily use it. Um, and then, uh, and there are, this, there are many, I would say, aspects of this question. Uh, one is just from the stdlib side, if we decided to, to include that, then I can, you know, I can start, I can implement all those um, intrinsic functions in Fortran and we can maintain them as community. And then we can ensure that the non-intrinsic functions are implemented using the same, I would say quality of implementation, um, as, you know, Bessel functions or signs and cosine error functions, are, I believe is only, the intrinsic is for real argument, I believe. So for complex argument, again, it would have to be in STDLib. Um, the, the, the other aspect of it is uh, what about a high performance implementation? And, you know, that we, we've been kind of brainstorming this. Uh, it would be nice if STDLib also included one way or another some higher performance implementation, perhaps, if we decide to do that. Um, and then, and, you know, and then other aspects of that is that there are, op I would say, there are, I would say, math implementations out there, open libm is one. LibPG math is another one. And of course, the standard C library also has uh, one. Um, so what I was thinking is that in STDLib, for example, we could call using ISO C binding, we could call into those C libraries as an option. Um, uh, or, you know, things to discuss is whether it should be an option to choose or whether we should only use, let's say, OpenLibM or if we should also maintain a pure Fortran implementation. Um, the, the reason I would like to have this as part of STDLib is because it, if it's the case that the compiler has to have some special tricks to make things fast, it'd be nice to expose them so that the user can also, so that it can be used for non-intrinsic functions also. Uh, and, you know, I, so I just was kind of wondering what you, what you think, if it's a good idea to, to do that. Uh, does does LLVM not provide you with uh, tools to implement intrinsics? Yes, so LLVM has some functions. I can remember. I think it, I can remember if it has signs and cosines, but it, it has um, it has some functions, but not all. I can give you a little perspective about live PG math and fl and flying and uh, both the classic flying and and uh, the LLVM flying. That'd the, be great. The, yeah. The <clears throat> The intent of this was to build a, um, a, a math intrinsics library that does support the kind of uh, actually three kinds of uh, performance, um, uh, you know, precise, you know, IEEE down to, um, uh, 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 you know, like a bit uh, of, uh, uh, or less than a bit of um, accuracy, the um, uh, a fast mode, and then something that was even faster called relaxed mode. <clears throat> the um, the choice of the intrinsic intrinsics that you use is largely done uh, can largely be done at at, at link time, um, but it can also be modified at runtime. Um, so, and, and in fact, uh, uh, we don't document we didn't document much of, of how to do it, but the capability included, um, you know, I want this set of intrinsics to run with um, uh, uh, precise arithmetic and these to run with relaxed or this one or two or three or half a dozen to run with relaxed so that you could kind of tailor the performance that, that you wanted. Um, <clears throat> uh, they're both, uh, uh, I, I don't know the status right now of live PG math and the runtime of flying. I haven't been paying much attention to flying, but um, it's certainly available in the, um, uh, uh, in, in the um, classic flying. Um, it doesn't, it's probably not extensible to support non-intrinsics, um, just in terms of what their design goal was at the time. It's just a giant set of jump tables in some regard that, that you know, allowed trampolining to the cor correct implementation of an intrinsics you're interested in. Um, uh, it's, the 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 long term goal was to take the exist uh, to to take the one that we put into LLVM flying and and branch it into a separate LLVM project 
uh, for exactly you know this kind of reuse across projects. But I don't know what the status of that is. It, it was always a uh, a goal, but not um, <laughs> it was always a goal, but never a project. Do you know which people would we should contact to to collaborate on this? Um, yeah, the the. Uh, um, You, you will have to involve Scalpone at NVIDIA because um, he runs all of the compiler stuff related to all of the Fortran, uh, Fortran C and C++ work that we do. Um, uh, Craig Topher, T-O-E-P-F-E-R, um, uh, as if anybody is, hang on a second, Craig, T-O-E-P-F-E-R. I put it in the chat. Craig is um, the the sort of math libraries manager. Um, I mean, he, he has he's responsible for other tools and, and applications and such at, at NVIDIA. But Craig is uh, the guy whose team implemented the uh, the, the the initial live BG math. Um, he's the one you would go to for for particularly technical questions. Steve would be the one you'd go to for policy questions. So I think what I should first do is contact Craig, figure out the technical, technical questions, if it even makes sense to do something what I'm envisioning. And then after that, uh, go to Steve Scalpone and see if we can uh, do that. Yeah, and, and um, uh, you know, as long as you're in Los Alamos, um, ask Pat McCormick and uh, Alexis, yeah. um, uh, uh, you know, if, if they have any, any recent news, they, they might have, um, either a point of view or a uh, uh, the most current status, and that way you can can um, tee up an appropriate request to Steve. <clears throat> okay, I'll I will do that, and then I'll follow up on that also with, uh, and I'll kind of inform. Um, I'll keep you updated on on this course. Of what the yeah, let saying. me know what let me know what I can do on it too, because I think it, you know, yeah, perfect. Yeah, it would it would definitely benefit the net sum of human happiness if we could if we could uh, leverage this. Perfect. Andre. So that's yeah, uh, just, just quickly back to your question on should there be intrinsics in SCD lib, what you described seems to me like a very narrow use case. Um, I'm not convinced that it would be at, le at least not a, not, not a priority. Um, intrinsics seem like a big can of worms. Um, um, and to force them into SD lib for a narrow use case. I don't think it outweighs the benefit of adding more higher level tools um, that we've been working on. So what's your plan to implement the non-intrinsic math functions? Let's say, you know, error function for complex numbers, stuff like that. What's the plan? Yes. Uh, those sound good to me if people ask for them. No, I mean, I, 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 I don't know personally anybody who uh, who uses Bessel functions. I, I don't use them, but I'm sure there are people who use them. If there's demand, uh, I'm all for it. No, but what I mean is, I, you know, I think we agree that it's part, it should go into STD lab, but the question mm -hmm. is, how do you, how do we plan to implement them? Because it seems to me it's exactly the same kind of, kind of worms as the intrinsic functions. Uh, it has to be implemented for single, double, quadruple precision and probably we should have a kind of a high precision, slower implementation and a less accurate, faster implementation. It's the, it seems to me it's the same kind of issues. It is it is same kind of issues, but at least we'd be implementing something that's not already in compilers. That That's the key difference from my perspective. And I, I think for intrinsics, you really need to have a really good reason to want them in due to a limitation that, uh, you know, compilers don't give you something that you need with intrinsics. Okay, cool. So I think that's all I have here. We can, we can move to the next uh, thing on the list, which is uh, a study lay by the other parts. Uh, let's see, there was, we have strings, OS model, proposals for clamp, and tool for documentation. So we can start with the strings. Sebastian, take it away. Okay. Um, 
I will just share uh, my screen a second. Okay. Um, yeah, we, uh, I made a proposal for simple standard string implementation so we can get started. And you can preview the specification I wrote for this here. And it basically implements all the intrinsic functions which the deferred length character implements which means that the AP itself should be unproblematic. So as unproblematic as possible. Because there's no function that is not read on in the standard in this implementation. So we, you get actually everything, you get the operators, you even get read and write. And it basically implements a derived type, string type, which is just the most basic string you can get. So the idea is to have something to get started so that we actually have strings in standard lib. And then can actually start to implement algorithms and more extended functionality. So repository is there. There's also a pull request associated to this. You can try this as a FPM project. Any other comments on this? I'd like to say just that um, I, I support this PR um, if I haven't approved it yet. Um, I think I'm about to. One, one suggestion that I had um, that I didn't write it out yet is, so I learned recently, and I think I learned it from this pull request that in Fortran, if you define say, dot eq dot operator uh, the equals operator uh, you also get the um, the two equal signs operator uh, uh, for free like you don't have to specify both names um, i think it'd be nice that in the definition of this module we define the operators with the more modern symbols rather than their uh, uh, their alphabetic variants. Yeah, so say an operator dot eq dot, which is defined as at operator equal sign equal sign. And then, you know, for users who want dot to, to use dot eq dot, they'd, they'd still get it. But at least the source code communicates uh, what I think is more modern notation. Okay. What do you think? No problem with this. Yeah, at, at least <clears throat> using uh, equal equal would be uh, would be the, the same as uh, what we do with the byte set module. The byte set module module we also use uh, equal equal instead of uh, the older one. So. And I don't think this has a practical implication for the user. So the way it is now, the user could still use equal equal and greater than and so on. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's really only about how it appears in the source code of this module. Yes. So it's a very, very minor nitpick. So the um, so basic question is um, what do you want to do uh, with this pull request? Uh, if, uh, do we agree on this as a general strategy for strings? So do we want to have the basic string type of standard lib being a functional string implementation? Or do we want to go for a, a object-oriented uh, string class instead?
This is the function implementation, but also in the same repository as a branch with a class implementation. So with abstract base class, which shows how you could implement a string in a class type fashion, which is fully extendable, but provides a full functionality. You could also have both if this is wanted and have some light, uh, some, some light object which is just the basic string type, works in a functional way. And for users that want some more powerful string type, allow them to extend from this abstract base class. So then those two would be separate things. Yeah, so I, I think that you could have, have both, at least at the beginning, in the experimental name space. And then uh, you can see uh, what people like most, or maybe both, I don't know decide later what you would like to version or not. Okay, sounds good to me. Then so. once we agree on the string type, I will make another proposal for a string class. Yeah, and I, and I think it's okay to also have both a string type and a string class. Understand right, the key difference between the two is one is extendable and the string class, the the methods are resolved at runtime. And for the type, uh, it has it has no methods, but it has um, interfaces over intrinsic function names uh, that are resolved at compile time. So I think we can reasonably expect that the string type may be a bit better performant in some cases. Uh, if I might, uh, yeah, add my opinion. So uh, I, I was convinced by uh, Sebastian and uh, your discussion about the string type, um, exactly due to due to the fact that it's uh, mostly resolved at compile time. So. And I think it still provides enough flexibility for for what we use uh, strings typically in Fortran. So like, um, I don't know, pasting together some file names or parsing some simple files. Um, I, I think it would work well enough. So uh, I might add a, a review if needed. Um, just let me know. That would be good for anybody. If you care about strings in SDLib, please go review, uh, complain, or approve the PR. OK. I have a question um, regarding this implementation. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, uh, I think there is another string type that has been used uh, currently in FPM. Uh, I wonder what is the relationship uh, between the two, between this uh, concept and that one. I think in the long term, we probably want to streamline or at least uh, consolidate efforts. And I don't know if something that is, what is used in FPM can be partially reused just to avoid the duplication of effort. But uh, I don't know the, the details. So this is why uh, I, I, I just throw on the table the, the, the comment just understand better. Let, let me comment on this. So I started uh, looking to standard lib uh, as I noticed that we are uh, duplicating more and more stuff in FPM, which should be part of standard lib rather than uh, reinvented in FPM. So first step, uh, in my opinion, was to just make something very basic. And then if we agree on this start, to port over functionality from FPM to standard lib. So we don't, um, because we, there's a lot of good functionality in FPM, mainly related to string processing and uh, operating uh, operation uh, and the operating system. And those doesn't belong in FPM. Those be just belong in the standard lib. We needed an FPM, but we just, put it in there so we get, can get working. But it's not something we have agreed on in the community that should look, should have this interface. So it can be optimized and should be optimized 
And if we agree, uh, find an agreement, it should be put in the standard so that the FPM should solely rely on those implementations instead of providing its own. Thank you. Moving on, uh, we have OS module on the agenda. I think also Sebastian, uh, what do you want to say about it? Um, yeah, I put the uh, OS module uh, on the agenda and now there uh, has been a lot of movement. So now I think it's already in a shape that we could use it in FPM, which is a good thing. And, but I hadn't I had time to look uh, into integrating it in FPM yet. Is this the so same the OS module question. called SDD Lib OS um, that yes. Martin and Arjen were working? Okay. Yeah. So I think right now it should be in shape uh, to work with, uh, with FPM and might be usable in FPM. Probably the next question is, should it be used as standard lib OS in FPM or should it be upstream in standard lib first? So we can iterate over the AP. I think probably would be better to put it first in SDB lib so that more people can try it and use it. I mean, if it goes in FPM, it's kind of bandit within FPM. But in FPM, it would be used immediately. And we could learn sooner. <clears throat> yeah, if people use FPM, yes. Agree. Well, I, I mean, strictly the so FPM developers would would use it uh, and already learn. But I don't know. I mean, this also raises a more general question about how do we want to develop such larger modules, like with standard lib OS and like I've done with standard lib string. Do we want to put them in a separate project so they can be tried out? to the standard lip and then start upstreaming them. Um, are there some, uh, maybe we can put together some guidelines how uh, how this process works so it's seamless and all, on all ends. So everybody knows how this project should be structured to make the transition from the external uh, project to a standard implementation as uh, painless as possible. Yeah, I, I think what, what you first described as having a staging package uh, on the side uh, for people to experiment with, that, that seems most natural to me for, for a bit larger additions that are also kind of self-contained, like say a string type or an OS uh, module, but say if, if we're adding one or two functions, uh, seems a bit overkill to to have in a separate, but I think both both approaches work. Uh, yes, some some guideline would be good to have. Um, I think they're both okay, and probably depends on uh, you know the contributor. What what approach is uh, more convenient for the for the contributor? Okay, in interest of time, moving on. So on the list, we have proposal for CLAMP, but actually I don't want to, I'm gonna share my screen and I don't want to necessarily propose CLAMP to you, but more raise an interesting uh, question to this uh, for discussion that came up with um, uh, my interaction with Ivan in this thread. Uh, so I opened this issue for clamp. Clamp is basically, a, a, it's a very simple function. You give it a real number and you give it a low and a high value. And the function returns the value itself. Is it in between low and high? And if it's outside of bounds, it returns you either of the bounds. And 
this is the example of um, how it works and what's the expected result. This is quite common in um, other languages and their standard libraries. I use it a lot in Python. I used it a little bit um, home cooked in, in Fortran. So it seems like it's uh, quite commonly used. And I put in a few example implementations. You can do like a min max kind of thing. Uh, you can do just kind of more verbose explicitly uh, if else if else uh, asking questions about the value of x. There's also a less accurate but uh, potentially more efficient branchless uh, clamp. Uh, so it, it has no branches and no doesn't doesn't invoke minimax uh, intrinsic. And then um, even proposed um, a wear clamp. Uh, initially, I didn't quite understand uh, the purpose uh, of this uh, wear clamp. And, you know, in the wear clamp, you have to have a separate imp implementation for scalar, and then you have specific implementations for uh, each rank, and then you wrap it in a, in a generic name. Uh, now, through discussion, uh, even explained, well, the purpose of this is that this way at compile time, uh, you, can, you can get an error if, if the programmer tries to use uh, clamp incorrectly, if uh, passing a different, um, like a, a array instead of a scalar for the, for the wrong argument. But I'm sorry, let me take a step back and say that my, um, the implementations I put, put here are all elemental functions. So if you just focus on this one, uh, so it's an elemental function. So each of these um, are a scalar, but also they can all be an array uh, of same shape or one or two of them can be an array and the other can be scalar. But that's also true for any of them. So you can have X as a scalar, you can have X max as a scalar and you can have X min as an array, but that's, you know, for clamp, that's obviously um, an incorrect use because uh, what are you really doing with that? And just to illustrate, I even gave an example, which really made me understand. If you do something like this, when you have an elemental implementation, well, you get this as a result. Uh, and that's clearly not, um, I mean, it's, it, it does what you said it to do, uh, but it's not, in the in the spirit of, uh, I, for lack of better, I, I don't know how to explain it really. But yeah, so 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 from my point of view, it, it's not in the spirit of what other languages offer. Uh, so like you okay. said, it it's technically doing what it's supposed to do, but um, I don't know. So 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 I, I just don't want some user to misadvertently uh, like use it the wrong way. Uh, but I can't really say like what, what people will try to do with this function. Um, R right. Yeah. Um, so just to reiterate, if you pass it an array of lower bounds, then this will be uh, clamped to each of them. And, and then you get a, get an array and this is inconsistent with APIs of um, other languages and, and standard libraries. Uh, so using a wear clamp would basically enforce the user to be able to only pass an array to the first argument uh, and not, so the, the second and third argument would be enforced to be scalar. Uh, uh, the downside, at least in my view, so what, what Elemental gives you is a really, really elegant implementation uh, in the sense that you, you just say it's elemental and you can take scalar, you can take arrays, you're done with it. With a where clamp, you need to write uh, many specific implementations. Uh, of course, in SDDlib, that will be wrapped in a FIP preprocessor. It will have to generate many specifics. Already with SDDlib, we have an issue of building it with uh, at, the, at the maximum rank of 15. 
uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of RAM, just because we have many, uh, many functions that have many specifics for different ranks, different um, type kinds, and so on. Uh, so if we took that approach, we have a less elegant implementation that is also more burdensome for the build. But if we take the elemental approach, uh, which is more elegant, then the user can inadvertently uh, use clamp as not intended. And what Ivan said just five minutes ago and made me realize that, well, there's also a question of, do we want to be consistent with other APIs or do we want to say, this use is okay if you really want that, but you're also, yes, it's more likely that the user could do this inadvertently, but maybe there is a use case that would want to do that. So passing multiple lower and upper limits, um, but clamping a scalar. Uh, and then so basically that would broadcast to an, a result that is an array. So uh, yeah, I, just throwing this out there, um, if there's any ideas, um, and specifically I was hoping to get some feedback on what you think is uh, a better approach to sort of favor the user and is be more enforcing on what you can do with this or be more favorable uh, to, to developers and um, the builders of SDLib who will now have to build a, a 10,000 line uh, implementation of Clamp. <laughs> I, maybe maybe a comment from my side. So I have it implemented as clip because I, I also know it from Python. I use the elemental version. Uh, I have never had any problems with that. Um, but what actually NumPy does, uh, you have it optional left and right. So you can say I want to clamp only to the lower bound or to the upper bound. Mm. That would be something that we should consider whether we want it or not. And the other thing, um, I, I use a real only implementation that returns not a number for debugging purposes in the case that your lower bound is higher than the upper one. Hmm. I, I don't know what you get. You probably get something valid out, but the result uh, depends on how you do the, um, the brackets, right? With the min max implementation there, you can, you have two variants and depending on how you do the order of your, of your min or max, you, you get then either the upper or the lower bound. Right, uh, right. But of course it's, I, I don't know what, what Python, I, I think NumPy also says, if you, if you do something like that, uh, it's, it's unreliable. And that would also favor a little bit the, the idea of an elemental function that you say, okay, if, if garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I mean, I don't see a problem when you put in a scalar and, and, and two arrays. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in the end something you can do. You, you need to have an idea how you use that function. So I don't see a, a big problem with the elemental routine. Right, right. Okay, that's useful. Anybody else? Uh, I'm, I might just, sorry, Sebastian, go ahead. Um... One thing about uh, which is favorable on elemental function is that you get more help for compiler uh, er uh, errors. So if you have a, a generic interface which is overloaded and you miss one argument, some compilers just give you uh, no uh, matching interfaces found, and you don't know exactly which argument to look at. Yeah, yeah, I hear that many times. Okay. Um, uh, I might just add uh, that. Um, so, um, if you want to avoid like uh, a bunch of pre-processing with uh, uh, FIP or pi pi pi, uh, you can actually implement this function in in C uh, using the Fortran 2018 enhancements. Uh, and because you are passing like an assumed uh, 
an assumed shape array. Uh, then through the C API, you have actually access to both the rank and the type. And then you can just have like a simple if loop. So whatever, if float, if double, uh, if rank one, if rank two, if rank three. Um, so th that's one option um, that, that is maybe sometimes easier than implementing in Fortran. Let's add it to the issue thread. Yeah, I, um, I, I'll create an example. Great, uh, thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, let's go to Martin and just quickly say um, about the tool for documentation. I, I think we have some um, answers already. Uh, and then Martin, please, because we have one more item about uh, uh, the flags and the suffixes uh, for modern fortune in FPM, uh, just take no more than a few minutes, please. Yes, I mean, it, if, if you have an answer already, I, I was just looking for a way how to, to document OS path. And um, the reason why I ask this, I mean, I, I know, of course, Ford, but I realized that there's not, not much going on. So is it is it a dead project? And do we want to base standard STD lib on a, on a dead project? Or is someone interested in, in taking over the development? Or does someone know this guy who started the project? Uh, yeah, we, we, know, we know Chris. Um, yeah, it hasn't been maintained uh, lately. I don't. I don't think of it as, as a dead project yet, simply because it's being used and it's being used for new projects also. I think it's been very useful for STD lib uh, and FPM. Uh, however, uh, also we, we should discuss at some point this, so this is a bigger, bigger topic is whether we want to uh, put effort to maintain it, uh, improve it. Specifically, what I find most lacking about Ford is uh, uh, lack of options to style what your uh, documentation website will look like. Uh, but yeah, so this has been discussed in one or more threads on SED Lib, and I'll, I'll, I'll tag you uh, in one of those. Um, Sebastian, do you, do you want to say anything about Ford at this time? Probably not. Mm, no, not really. So I think uh, so. it's just about styling. There's still the possibility to just give a custom CSS. Mm. OK, I wasn't but aware of it. You have to replace Bootstrap. CSS, which is huge. Okay. So not as easy. I was also very happy when I found it once, but then I realized, I don't know, when you have a second level of submodules or something like that, it didn't work. So I can't use it for my project. And then I wanted to file a bug report and realized that exactly this bug report is there for two years. So then I thought, okay, I mean, not 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 something that helps me at the moment and also something not something where yeah i, I want to rely on but if it's the best we currently have uh, it's it's certainly better than nothing yeah so so as far as i know uh chris created it uh, i guess during uh his phd uh and i i guess now he's uh yeah busy with other projects so uh, that's why he's not maintaining it actively. And uh, yeah, like, like Milan has said, uh, long term, it would be nice to have something else, but it's better for than nothing. Emmanuel, do you want to discuss um, uh, Fortran uh, source file suffixes, and mo modern Fortran and FPM? Yes, thank you. Um, well, the idea, I don't know if, I don't think everyone is uh, familiar with the idea. The idea that I came up with was simply to give mostly a, a cosmetic um, um, operation to, to Fortran, in my opinion, 
um, and uh, uh, this is mostly to appeal to new users in my mind when I when I conceived this idea, um, because simple things like the extension, and that's where basically we have discussed most of the time. Um, Usually it happens often. I mean, I read continuously, for example, that the, the fact that uh, F90, that is the de facto uh, extension for the um, uh, modern photos so or the, the free form uh, of, of uh, source code, um, it really reminds you how old uh, the, um, the language is actually, well, actually we know that it's the first high level language, right? Um, the problem is that there is this perception um, that basically uh, the, the language has not moved on, uh, except our, maybe our circle. That, of course, we all know we all want to 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 we, we want to promote the newer features, but there is this sort of perception. So, the idea was to enforce by default. Uh, the proposal is to to enforce by default these cosmetic features, like for example using again dot f as the fortran freeform as the fortran extension that in the modern days is a freeform um, extension and this will not require any change to the standard will not require any change to the um, compilers of course the compiler vendors because for obvious reasons both the standard committee and the compiler vendors do not uh, cannot make this change happen in the in the in the future in the in the reasonable future. So uh, I thought that uh, FEM could do that, could offer this as the default. Uh, in this way, we can show we can I can pro promote to my students, for example, that Fortran is <laughs> does not require implicit none. For example, that's another again purely. Uh, uh, cosmetic aspect, uh, but uh, I think it makes a difference. I can promote to my students that you, they don't have to use F90, but they, they use F like they do for C. Uh, they, they write dot C instead and dot F. It's a cosmetic uh, operation. Uh, uh, I, of course, we have a huge amount of code that is legacy code that is extremely important uh, for uh, for the language. Uh, and uh, we will obviously not leave this them uh, in the cold. Oh, we have uh, one minute uh, to the end. Sorry. Uh, and th there could be another uh, switch in some way it needs to be designed to make easy uh, to to revert this sort of uh, of defaults easy in an easy way. That's that's in a, in a few words. And uh, you might see that uh, um, Andre, for example, has mentioned a few pros and cons uh, in, the case, in the specific case of, uh, um, of the extension, the .f extension. Um, I, I, at this point, I encourage you to have a look at, at them. I have given my own idea. I know I, I might be sometimes um, too extreme. I don't know. I think I, I, I try to be reasonable, but I know there are different, I know this is one of the, dev, the divisive um, topics in, in the photo community. I've seen it in the past, in the past years. So I'm not expecting to be, to, to get 100% uh, approval on that. Thank you, Manuel. Any comments? Uh, we discussed this a lot and um, many of us wrote, wrote what we thought about it. I, I mostly agree. Um, I don't see a reason to have uh, multiple uh, suffixes uh, in use. Uh, I also understand the, the burden of existing defaults and existing conventions uh, that are deeply rooted. And yeah, I'll always always ask how best to move forward uh, from from the present rather than uh, from the past. Are existing conventions really uh, stopping us, or it's more like an illusion? Uh, can, can I ask uh, Steve a question, Steve Lionel? <clears throat> Was there ever any thought given to the notion of say using .f? You know, has this historically for um, uh, 
old Fortran, uh, you know, or uh, uh, fixed form Fortran, and .ff for modern Fortran? Well, I mean, I, I, I cover this in, in, a, in an old blog post on my Dr. Fortran site. I mean, you know, first of all, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, the Fortran standard doesn't say anything about file types or file names or how, uh, you know, what, what source files look like, really. Um, but, you know, there were .f and .for were, were pretty common. Uh, back in the Fortran 77 days. And um, I, to me, the, the thing that was most alarming was to see uh, after compilers started using .f90 that users started writing .f95, .f03, uh, et cetera, which was, is, was just completely off base because it had nothing to do with what version of the standard uh, they were using. Uh, I, if I had a time machine to go back and, and try to you know, convince the, the, the compiler writers to create some sort of more neutral uh, for, uh, file type for free form, that would be great. I, I just, I think it, it is, a, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna say it's a complete waste of time to try to uh, say, well, we're gonna make FPM assume that everything is free form source. And all that means is that, that there are gonna be people who want to use FPM and they'll try it and it'll fail on them and they'll just say, oh, screw this. Um, I'll just do it my old way with, with a make file or whatever. So I know I'm, I'm in this, this old fuddy-duddy, uh, but I, I just can't believe that we're spending any time on trying to change people's behavior by uh, modifying the behavior of a new tool that you want to introduce. That's my two cents. I, my, my position is if, if FPM does anything about this, it will make sure that the fixed form is compilable. I yeah. I, if you want to have FPM say, you know, give up some sort of informational message or a warning and says, did you really want to do this? And, and, you know, maybe it would be better if you converted this to free form source. That would be great. You know, try, coerce people, but, or, or uh, convince people, but just to, to throw up a bunch of errors, you know, or they'll have get compiler errors. They won't necessarily get errors from FPM. And they'll look at this and say, you know, what's wrong with this? I and mean, we see this all the time where people, they take, they take some code that they saw printed in a, in a book somewhere and it's fixed form and they type it in as .f90 and then they wonder why the, why the compiler complains. Uh, I see this maybe six or seven times a year um, and it still happens. So you know, if you want people to use FPM, don't, don't put roadblocks in their way. Um, would it be an idea to um, uh, to identify the source, the source form uh, within FPM and make some suggestions about that? <coughs> Is it at all uh, um, possible in a, uh, um, how do you call it, in a robust way? I, uh, I, I might try to answer. So I wrote a few comments about this. Uh, in, in, actually, I replied to Steve. Um, and, and at first, I was actually quite um, captivated by this idea of, of uh, differentiating source forms um, or automatically detecting. But when you go deeper into the problem, um, let's say if, if, you, if you would take the, uh, a classifier for different programming languages, they typically work by uh, extracting the tokens out of the source code and then uh, of course, like different languages have very different tokens. Uh, for example, no other language has the subroutine word, and it's quite um, specific to Fortran. So, so actually, free form and fixed form they don't differ by the tokens because the same tokens are valid in either form. So, uh, the only possibility then is that uh, you differentiate files based on the frequency of stuff such as comments. So like, uh, because you'll have C instead of, uh, um, 
uh, sorry, I forgot the name for this simple the symbol uh, we use. Mission for... mark. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, very likely if there's a source file which has a bunch of uh, uh, blanks in the first six positions, it's highly likely that it's free form, but at the same time, it could still be, um, sorry, it's very likely it's fixed form, but of course, maybe someone just likes to use six spaces. So like on more thought, um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced by it, <laughs> even though I was initially enthusiastic about this idea. Yeah. And also keep in mind that you can write thought on source code in a way that is both fixed and free form. Which yeah, is the, sometimes the, find in include headers for Fortran. Yeah, that, that that was that's a point that I keep making. You can write Fortran 2018 in fixed form. Now, fixed form is obsolescent, so compilers have have been has been since 2008. Compilers have the ability to warn uh, for use of, of fixed form, and maybe what will happen is compilers over time will issue a warning by uh, a message, some sort of diagnostic by default that says it's obsolescent. Um, I don't expect it to ever be deleted from the standard. I would not, I would not support that. If, if I just might add my, my personal uh, perspective. So I, I, uh, I actually like what uh, Emmanuel proposed and uh, um, I see the appeal in using .f um, but I'm also, yeah, a bit worried, like uh, about all the problems it might bring. So, um, especially once FPM would want to integrate with other build systems, it would mean we'd have to really make sure that uh, the build systems are getting the fixed or free flag, and it might create other errors. But um, yeah. at the same time, I, I also know what um, so uh, what Milan said that it might just be an illusion, you know, like. Until we we wouldn't try, we can't actually know uh, if, if it's really possible. We, we I, I, just, need... I know we are Sorry, going to time, but I want to just Manuel, make a comment after, yeah, if possible. We either need to detect or put it on the user to mark specific source files as text form. Go ahead, man. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the only comment I wanted to make is that if I understand correctly how FPM works, it needs to be, if you want to use a dependency, it needs to be packaged by FPM. So this means that every time that we package something, we need to specify a number of things about any dependency. So to be honest, I found unlikely that all this bunch of errors or problems that we might have randomly using FPM will act, happen in practice. Because if I have a legacy library that has been packaged and has to be packaged be, to be used as a dependency in the correct way, I will never run into a problem with as long as I use FPM. So in a sense, we can create some sort of ecosystem uh, within FPM where things are not 100% robust, of course, but I don't know, 90% or reasonably robust. Um, that's my idea, but I, I share, I, I want to qualify and I'll close here. I share the, 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 what Ivan said, I, I, I as well, although I like very much this idea, I agree on the fact that there is confusion, there is the risk of confusion. We need to be careful to, uh, to support the other, the other building systems, of course, with FPM, I, I agree. In fact, I am as well worried about this, but I think it's something we can, we should try, in my opinion. Emmanuel, just to, um, to add to that, I think the, the friction point is not necessarily with the user pulling in a package dependency. The friction point is with the packager of a legacy dependency. So it's about convincing the developer uh, to package uh, their le legacy library uh, as an FPM package or to take that burn onto FPM community. Uh, but yes, once, once it's an FPM package, I see no problem either. Because then you've, you've told it everything it needs to know.
I'm sorry, I mentioned, I said that I would have stopped, but <laughs> I am too tempted to add a very little uh, uh, observation. Yes, but I, I, I noted, I also mentioned in my, in my issue that uh, actually many times that you need to package some legacy code, you need to use several other flags that are not really standard usually. So anyway, you need some sort of attention to package your, your library usually. So I don't see, to be honest, I don't see a huge issue in adding one or two flags um, when you package your legacy library, but, uh, and promise this time is my last comment. <laughs> this is a good comment to end with. All right, thank, thank you everybody. All right, bye everybody. Bye.